Welcome to another episode of Let Go and Lead, where we discuss new realities of leadership with pioneers, provocateurs, and passionate leadership champions. Today's guest is someone I've admired for her pioneering leadership at the helm of some of this country's largest and most influential organizations. Sylvia Burwell is the current and first woman president of the prestigious American University in Washington, D.C. I have the pleasure of serving with Sylvia on the university's board of directors, where I've had a chance to personally witness and benefit from her leadership style. In this episode, Sylvia shares her approach, which has guided her across very different experiences with government, nonprofit, and private sector organizations. No matter what type of organization you are leading or you aspire to lead, this conversation with Sylvia will provide inspiration and practical advice to guide your journey. So get comfortable and get ready to let go and lead. Hi, Sylvia. Welcome to Let Go and Lead. I'm so glad to have you join us. Meryl, thank you so much for inviting me to join. Happy to be here. Thank you. You know, first, I'd just like to give our um, viewers a sense of your background because it's such an incredible background. I actually have to read from some notes to make sure that I give it its due justice, but you've held two cabinet positions in the U.S. government. You served as the 22nd Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services from 2014 to 2017. And what blows me away is you managed a trillion-dollar department. I can't even get my head around that. You had the NIH, the CDC, the FDA, Medicaid, Medicare. And throughout all that, as though you didn't have enough to manage, you actually successfully implemented the Affordable Care Act. So that's like right there. Whew. Then on top of that, um, you served as the off- in the Office of Management and Budget, You negotiated a two-year budget following the 2013 government shutdown and had incredible experiences at two of the world's largest foundations, both the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where you were chief operating officer, and the Walmart Foundation, where you were its president. And as though that's not enough, you have two young children with um, your husband, Stephen, and are on the board of MetLife and Guardian. So, of course, the first question anyone would have is, how did she do it? Well, you know, one thing I would say is that uh, one thing's very important is my partner, my husband, Stephen. Uh, it's, uh, we are a team, uh, and that's a big part of how we do the family part, is that we are a team. And I'm very fortunate uh, and blessed to have a wonderful partner in that. And the other part is actually partnership well as well, in the sense that, Uh, In all the places I've been, I have had great teams, Uh, great teams of people uh, that work on these issues with me and uh, we work together. And that's a big part of how one is able to kind of do a a number of things at the same time. And of course, now you're president of American University, our first woman president, which is fabulous. And tell us about what really gave you the impetus to get into education. So I came to higher education after uh, my last time in public service, my second time in public service. And I came to higher education because I thought it was an incredible time in higher ed, that there are important tectonic shifts that are occurring in higher ed. And those shifts are around the future of learning, the future of work, how we think about the economics of higher education and issues of affordability and access. And the fourth thing was, Universities are a microcosm of the nation and both the challenges and opportunities. And that is a big part of what attracted me to higher ed. And what it attracted me to American University is it is a place that embraces that change, that leads in, leans into doing it and embracing and thinking about the future versus focusing on the past. And um, Chris, you put together an incredible plan with your seven year strategic plan around change makers for a changing world. Can you talk a little bit about that? So I'll talk a little bit about putting the plan together as well as what is in the plan, uh, because those two things are very related. When I got to American University, I asked a, over a thousand people three questions, and those were staff, faculty, students, alumni, people in our neighborhood, influentials in higher ed and elsewhere. And I asked three questions. One, 
what is the one thing we must change as a university to go to our next level? Two, what's the one thing we must keep the same as a university to go to the next level? And number three, what differentiates American University? And you could not get into this conversation or any of the questions without something that came forward time and time again. And that is that this is a place where the students, the faculty, the staff, the institution as a whole is a place that focuses on change, that focuses on how do we make the world a better place. And that gets reflected from the history of the university. Our law school was founded uh, in the late 1800s by two women who couldn't get a law degree, so they fixed that problem by starting a law school, the Washington College of Law of American University. Uh, we're the first university in the U.S. to be carbon neutral. We're the first university in the U.S. to have an anti-racist research and policy center, but there are just so many examples. And so put together a strategy. Our strategy focuses on what is the core DNA, which I just described, of American University, and how do we take that into the future, focusing on three key areas, scholarship, and research, teaching and learning of our students, and community. And, you know, it's so interesting to me because when you first asked me to join the board, I, I really joined the board to work with you. And then I realized, wow, this university is absolutely phenomenal. It is incredible, the whole history and, and just everything that you're doing. What now are you seeing as the biggest challenges for you going forward? So, you know, I think there are kind of two types of challenges that I think about for the university. And one set of those challenges is about the challenges that are sort of the 30,000 foot big tectonic uh, challenges. This question of what does the future of higher education look like and how should we think about it? And so there are those challenges thinking about American University in the context of the future. And then there are the day-to-day -day challenges. And some of the day-to-day -day challenges that I would mention are challenges that aren't just for the university. Issues of mental health and wellness are challenges across our society. They were, they existed before COVID, but certainly have been exacerbated. So these issues of well-being, of thriving, uh, especially for our students are things that we're very focused on thinking about what has changed and how do we think about it. Also, another place where there have been important changes that we as a university need to meet the moment is how people think about work uh, and whether that's in the context of modality, in the context of how they think about what they're doing, and it relates often to these issues of thriving. And what do you think right now uh, students are most concerned about in the university? You know, I actually think this is, it's important that one reflects that students are not a monolithic uh, body. Right. And yeah. that is one of the things that I think we as a university also have to recognize, that there are different students that are reflecting on different things. And certainly I think all students, though, are reflect on, reflecting on this issue of wellness and, and well-being and their concerns around stress, anxiety, um, as well as that whole continuum from stress and anxiety through uh, what are very severe mental illnesses as well. Uh, that folks come to our university medicated. I think that's an issue that's almost on everyone's mind. I think our students are very focused on the question of the value proposition. Uh, what are they gaining for what they are paying uh, at a university like ours? I think our students are very focused on the problems of the world. Uh, at American University, uh, one cannot walk across the campus without seeing or hearing about an issue, whether that's sustainability, whether that's democracy, whether that's inclusion, whether that's scientific research and its importance to solving problems. And so our students are interested in many different areas and many different uh, places where there are complex problems that the world needs uh, leaders that our students, we hope, are going to be. And you attract so many students that are change makers, as you say, which is really fantastic. You have an incredible alumni roster. Tell us about some of the alums of American University. You know, uh, American University has a, a number of folks, and uh, whether that's Gary Cohn, who was the head of the National Economic Council uh, uh, in terms of uh, jobs that are in government, but also um, people like Susan Zarinsky, who was the first head of a network uh, in terms of a uh, first woman head of a network. And she worked her way up, and she'll describe the story of when she was at American University and how she got her job. And 
Um, actually, there was a movie, uh, Network News, that was written about her uh, and how she has so many stories in terms of a person who has contributed in so many different ways. And also, there's what American University has so many different pieces and parts. We have something called the Washington Semester Program, and some names that folks will real, uh, recognize from the Washington Semester Program are Donna Shalala, Paul Ryan, and Michael Dukakis, all alumni of our Washington Semester Program. Yeah, that's really incredible how many have really benefited from the whole curricula and the opportunities that American gives them. You know, I'm kind of interested in going back to some other parts of your career. And in, in, it's interesting that you've been in government, you've been in foundations, you've had a variety of different experiences. Do you feel that your leadership style changed as you had these different environments? I think that my leadership style probably changed and involved as I uh, matured and learned, uh, as well as I'm not, the roles contributed things, but the fundamentals of leadership, I believe, apply no matter what type of role that you're in. And, you know, some of those principles for me are the clarity of mission or problem that you're working on. Getting to that clarity, having a strategy and approach to it is important so that everyone can join in and be uh, part of it. Another thing that I think carries over is just the question of how one can creates community uh, in terms of working against issues so that you have an entire organization that is leveraged against the problems. And that's why clear articulation of what you're trying to do and then having the community uh, come along in that way. And a part of that, as I had mentioned, is that you have great teams, uh, great teams that bring along their teams. Uh, so that you're leveraging across the entire organization. One of the things I've seen at AU is you do have a really great team and a very diverse team. And I don't mean just from a demographic standpoint, but a style standpoint and thought process standpoint. How do you really identify and find those people? I think one of the most important things when one is looking uh, to build a team is to remember, don't create a team that looks like you. A team is not, to me, team doesn't mean a bunch of people that look like me. Team means different people that bring different things. Um, there is research that shows the, the outcomes are improved when you have diversity, and it's all kinds of diversity. And that's because you're able to see the problem, I believe, and the solution from different ways and different shapes. And so when I look to build teams, I often look to make sure that I do have people with different styles um, because each of them brings something that's quite important and an approach uh, as well as thinking that helps us be better. And what do you think are the most critical elements of a leadership team? So one uh, is uh, the old phrase that there's no I in team. <laughs> and that is probably one of the most critical elements that I believe is necessary to create a team. And that is a group of people who truly believe that they want to work in partnership and that others add value uh, and that they are helped by working well with each other. And so I think that is a grounding and fundamental principle that you want to seek when you're building team in addition to all of the other skills. You've spoken about the cornerstone for achieving institutional and educational excellence and it's really manifested itself in the plan for inclusive excellence. What do you think is most critical about that? So uh, the inclusive excellence plan here at American University is a plan that we developed actually even before the strategy. This plan came into uh, place even before the strategy. It was an important time at the university where we needed a plan and specific focus and a strategic approach to how we were going to get to inclusion. And we chose inclusive excellence as our strategy and the framing. It, it was a, an approach that actually had existed since the early 2000s in terms of making sure that you're working across different areas, whether that's policy, culture, um, actual numbers in terms of uh, diversity and other issues. But one of the things, so it had a number of different elements but one of the things that was most important, and I believe it's most important, is recognizing that 
inclusion is a part of excellence, that you really can't be excellent in today's uh, work. And whether that's you're in retail or whether you're in a, at a university without these concepts of inclusion and that the concepts of inclusion are about all kinds of things. Uh, and they are about everything from the work that we do on our campus on issues of race to disability, uh, to differing points of view. And so this concept of inclusion to make you stronger, especially at a university where education and hearing and thinking are such important things is something that has been an anchor for us. And do you see a difference between leading internally and leading externally? I don't think about leading differently uh, internally uh -huh. or externally. Uh, I think so many of the same principles uh, apply, whether it's uh, the no I uh, in terms of when I'm leading externally, the making sure that I'm living the no I and, and how um, I do that both internally and externally, as one thinks about some of the key principles of the importance of listening, respect, um, hearing others. I think all of those things are uh, equally as important when one is leading internally or leading externally. You're also now leading quite an ambitious development program for the university. And I'm curious, did any of your foundation experience play into how you set that campaign up? So this was before you joined the board, Meryl, when I was being interviewed, but that was one of the questions, you know, you've never raised money was one of the, the questions you've been on the giving end. You know, I was at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And so that is a place or the Walmart Foundation where that's a place where you're giving money. But it, it's interesting because from my perspective, certainly being the director of OMB and being uh, head of the largest department from a financial perspective in the federal government, you are seeking money. It is the United States Congress that controls your purse strings uh, in terms of the, those issues. And so the principles that apply when one is working with Congress on issues of funding are the similar, are similar pr principles that apply in development. It was helpful to be on the other side in terms of the philanthropic work I've done, because I think that does make sure that you understand the import of thinking about how you want to get alignment, alignment of the needs of the university with the desires of those that you're working with. And that importance about alignment and listening, uh, having been on both sides of this equation, uh, one realizes the importance in both seats. I would think it would be so fascinating to be surrounded by young people all day long. And what's that been like? You know, it's actually probably one of the best parts of this job. Um, it's sometimes one of the hardest parts, but one of the best parts of the job, I say, being the um, head of a university is much more like being a mayor and being the secretary of HHS is much more like a CEO. And one of the most fundamental differences is the proximity to the students and to the faculty and to the staff. And so already today, you know, I walked to work this morning, saw a bunch of our students, saw our staff um, as I came. Um, I went out because a group of our students right now as part of creating awareness uh, of a program here at American University called the Frederick Douglass Scholars, um, we're creating a mosaic of the painting, a painting of Frederick Douglass. And so I went over and painted one of the tiles uh, with the students. And I have to say, Meryl, it is like doing that was the best part of my day. Uh, and being able to be with the students and meet the students from all over the country. And even just like being able to sit while they were talking with each other uh, is a, a wonderful thing and a wonderful opportunity. This morning, I had the chance to meet with all of our student government leaders from the law school, from the graduate school, from our Residence Life Association, student government. And that is an opportunity. It is uh, an opportunity for me to learn uh, in terms of learn about not just our university, but the world and the world that these young people are becoming a part of and shaping. So that closeness and being around is one of the things that is um, great about the job. There are certainly times where it presents challenges, but for the most part, it is the uh, one of the best parts. Well, it's probably one of the 
few jobs really where you could be at your level in the organization and interacting with your customers every single day. That's right. That's got to be really great. Yeah. You you know, you've also shared with me that this is probably the most complex job you've ever had. And why is that? You know, I think it's uh, the complexity of the stakeholder, uh, the stakeholder lack of alignment at times, um, together with the proximity to all of those different stakeholders. Uh, I live in the neighborhood, so whenever there's a problem in the neighborhood, I, I hear from the neighbors directly. The complexity of two things, interests that are not um, necessarily aligned. And that happens in other places, but it is uh, sometimes, you know, there are so many varied stakeholders uh, that are part of a university community. And that's one of the things that I think it makes it so complex. It's interesting to think about that it would be, the alignment would be more complex than working with Congress. <laughs> that's fascinating. And I think there's another part of that, which is um, incentive structures and how things have, have developed in, in higher education also um, a part of that. Even when one is working with someone across the aisle on you know uh, an issue of disagreement, the framework that everyone comes with is the same, which is, you know, if you're a member of Congress, you're here to serve and represent the people and represent their views. And it is about shaping a government that works for them. And so you share that objective. You, you're you actually, uh, you know, you may be in the same sport. You, you know you're playing, if you were a sports thing, you know you're playing the same sport, where that's not exactly the same. That's interesting. What, what are you learning about creating that alignment among all these disparate stakeholders? It is uh, a point that you raised earlier, Meryl, in terms of creating that alignment. It's the concept of community and how people feel joined, connected, and part of something together. And whether that's um, uh, our neighbors, we had a family movie night here on our campus for all the neighbors to bring their children uh, and do something like that. So we're sharing to the campus participated in an event for the area in Washington, D.C. We are that we're part of called Tenley. And we opened up our art museum and had a special entrance uh, for everybody who wanted to come. And we're part of a whole kind of community uh, festival. And so whether it's doing things like that or creating sense of community with our students, the students that were painting were not just all scholars. There were others that were coming by and painting and learning about the program. But it is working on those things which help people see a, a shared mission, a shared goal and a shared approach and values. You know, this just makes me think of the fact, too, that it's so complex to run a university because, of course, you're not just running an educational system. You're, you know, as you mentioned, you have neighbors. You've got a lot of zoning issues. You have housing, food service, sports. What, um, how do you keep all that going and kind of keep your arms around a variety of disciplines that have very different issues within each one. It comes back again to the strength of the team. Yeah. Um, and having a clear strategic approach. So you know um, what are the core issues that everyone needs to be focusing on on a regular basis. Um, at the same time, they're doing the bread and butter work of every day, making the university run and having core teams that are able to do that. Let's talk a little bit about leading in crisis. Obviously, the last several years have been an incredible crisis, not just for the world, but certainly for higher ed. Talk a little bit about what you've been experiencing and how you've tackled it. In terms of crisis, when uh, you know, I my first year when I was back at the Office of Management and Budget, uh, of course there was what was what is now the third largest and longest shutdown uh, of the government. I went to HHS and. Uh, that's when records were being set with regard to young people coming across the border. Those records have since been broken. Um, and of course, Ebola and at a university, there's COVID. And so this issue of managing during crisis, I think, has some important things. The first one is remembering that the entire organization and those around you um, will cue off of you. And so your level of 
uh, anxiety is just going to get to reverberate throughout the organization and accelerate uh, in, in terms of that. So making sure that you are a part of helping everyone. These are challenging situations and you need to be a, a, an important part of the calmness and, and the ensuring everyone we will work through and we're going to be okay. And that I think is one important thing. The second important thing is really um, being able to focus on, okay, what are the core measures we need to get out of this? And really getting that, the sense of it, I can remember putting together the Ebola dashboard uh, with the head of USAID and the head of CDC. And they weren't necessarily always agreeing, but we had to get to where, because usually in crisis, you're going to have to work in teams and you're going to have to work across teams. So getting that clarity on, okay, here's what our priorities are. We're all agreeing so that people can go off and do their parts and work together. And that's a third element of this crisis, of crisis um, leadership that I believe is important is how you bring a team together to work together. When people are extremely tired, when people are nervous, when they're under strain and stress. And so how you bring a team together to both, uh, you know, have one plus one equal three in terms of that ability to bring people together when it's a hard, when people are, are worried, when people are strained, when people are stressed, they may not be at their best, but you all have to think your best of each other uh, and work as a team. And you need to figure out how to do that as a leader to make that happen. And what are some tips you'd have for our viewers on how to really do that? You know, one of the things, and, and there's no substitute for it, I believe, is uh, bringing people together. We certainly do it by Zoom, but by physical presence when you can, in terms of having every, you know, having everybody in the room and setting the standard for that listening, because you need to cascade that. So to get the right input, to get the right answers, you know, you want to do that in the room with the leaders so that they are then in turn going out. And so it is about modeling some of the behaviors you want. Um, and the other thing is, I don't think there is a substitute for presence in terms of those Ebola meetings for many, many, <laughs> for a number of months, I led the meetings uh, in terms of, that was important in terms of modeling, but it was also in, uh, important in terms of the support for the team. Some of those issues that we were talking about, making sure that you're there um, supporting the team. And you talked about the importance of being calm. And um, I've often noted how incredibly calm you are under very difficult circumstances. How have you developed that ability in yourself? You know, I think over, uh, over time, and the, part of it is uh, the realization and, and, and knowledge that acting on being emotive is not action that gets results on in almost all cases that is not it being emotive is about you it's not about the organization it's not about you know if you're in a family it's not about usually being emotive is really quite a a, a self it's about you versus maintaining that you know and this is something that hopefully i have evolved you know, when I talked about over time, you know, hopefully I've gotten better at this skill <laughs> uh, over time. But part of helping me get better is the realization that when one is emotive, as I said, you know, it's not usually going to be uh, helping things. It's not the way to move the ball forward, even if it's a situation that really is quite upsetting to you. So if it's so upsetting, do you want it to be different? You know, uh, you know it was a, a very difficult day. You can imagine for the Affordable Care Act, the day after the election, when, you know, everyone on my team felt like all the work that we had done might, you know, uh, there had been promises to undo the Affordable Care Act and everything. And being emotional wasn't the answer. What was the answer was putting together a strategy to make that not be the reality. So I think that the the question of the, the um, when others around you are just, uh, getting spun up and it comes, I think actually in two forms uh, in terms of how one needs to think about it and respond. And one is in the context of a problem and you are working on it together as a team, 
and everybody's just spinning. And, you know, that and how one uses the being calm and the, you know, step-by-step methodical, here's what we need to do. Here's what we need to, you know, let's all agree. Here's the problem. And you can walk people through to kind of get them uh, to that place. That is different from when you are in a situation where basically someone's trying to pick a fight and those situations exist. And when you are in those situations, in certain ways, those are harder because generally speaking, people are just going to keep coming at you and they're coming at you usually in personal ways, uh, generally speaking, uh, in terms of some of the situations that leaders face. And I think I would say that that probably sometimes is harder, but getting yourself to the place where you're not believing that you have to step out of the personal and you just, again, have to go back to what is best, what is best, what is best, what, what is the pass forward? If I take this action, you know, and respond and engage, where am I going? Versus if I continue on the path I'm on, what's going to maximize for where I want to be? What is it that I want? And just, you know, kind of keep going back to what's the objective? Okay. How do I get there? I remember the board meeting where we first started talking about the fact that COVID was going to drastically affect the future of the organization. And I remember it was at a point in time when almost all of us on the board thought we'd be back to work in two weeks. And of course, with your background and your knowledge, And having been through things like this before, you were, I would say, coaxing us along to the reality that this was going to be a long, hard slog. And I just wonder what that experience was like for you when you could see it, but so few people around you could even imagine it. First of all, I knew that it is a pandemic and with any of these things and with most things in life, you are going to get more facts and things are going to evolve and change, but especially a pandemic and in these early stages. So you knew it was going to evolve and change, but there were some core facts and these were different than Ebola. And the two things that so convinced me, um, one was transmission, the, the means of transmission. Ebola is actually harder to transmit than COVID. COVID, because we can breathe and transmit, that was always the thing that we were worried about, that there would be uh, a virus that that would transmit this way and be so easily transmissible. That was number one about what was so difficult about, uh, about this. And when you combine something so easily transmissible with the fact that it had, it was asymptomatic in people, so you didn't know. Um, these were two things that kind of kept me uh, leaning in as I, as you are reflecting that I was doing. Yeah. And, you know, now in hindsight, of course, we're all there, but I, it, I, it was just so fascinating to be in those early stages. And I went home and said to my husband, Mark, I'm like, Oh my God, <laughs> my brain was just blown open. You know? Yeah. It was really something else. As, as the board have said so many times, we are just so fortunate for your leadership. So thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for joining the team. It's a great team to be on. One of the questions that I always ask everyone is, what do you think leaders most need to let go of? Because we always talk about what you need to learn, but but what should you let go of? I think what you should let go of I'll simplify it and it's more nuanced than that, but is the past. Because I think one of the most important things about being a leader is thinking about and embracing the future. You're the person who has to be on the edge of that at all times, both in terms of your learning, uh, as you're learning and thinking about what's the future going to look like? Um, How should I be thinking about that? You're supposed to be seeing around the corner. And so letting go of the way that you have done it previously or um, understanding that there's change. And that is just so important at a university when you just see it so clearly uh, with the young people, how they approach things, how they do things differently, um, and just really having your listening ears into your point about what is it you let go. You have to be willing to let go. And once one has like a series of experiences and, and 
all of that, you know, it's hard sometimes to, to let go because it's as if it's not valued, but it's not. What you need to do is think about that as it's context for the future. And so the thing that I would say is holding on to uh, uh, a world that doesn't exist anymore is probably one of the most important things I think to let go. You know, it's really interesting because I've been doing this podcast and its predecessor, which was um, other video interviews for, I don't know, almost 15 years. And you were the first person who said that. Isn't that interesting? That is. And I think it's it's a great answer. People just tend to go in different directions, you know, but yeah, it's really interesting. And thank you for Let Go and Lead. I am happy to be here and happy to spend a little time with you, Meryl. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Sylvia as much as I did. It was really interesting that over all my interviews throughout this podcast, Sylvia is the first to say that leaders should let go of the past. She said that since leaders need to be thinking about what the future is going to look like, holding on to a world that doesn't exist anymore is one of the most important things to let go. She emphasized that our past experiences, of course, have value, but we should be learning and thinking about the changes to come so we can better lead our teams into the future. Sylvia also shared what she considers the fundamentals of leadership, which she said applies no matter what type of role you're in. First, you need to get clarity of the mission or problem you're working on. Second, you need a strategy and a clear articulation of that approach so that everyone can see themselves in it. Third, you need to create a community in a way that ensures the entire organization is leveraged against the issues. And finally, you need great teams that bring along their own teams in support of that approach. I also really appreciated Sylvia's points about being calm and not emotive in difficult circumstances. As she noted, we're all faced with situations that are disappointing or personally upsetting, but she's learned over time that being emotive is not the answer. Instead, she said, focusing on developing a strategy that addresses the underlying issues will always get you better outcomes. Sylvia and I covered a lot of ground in this discussion, and I'm grateful for her willingness to share a bit about her leadership experiences and philosophy. I hope you'll take away some great learnings, and thank you for joining us. See you next time on Let Go and Lead.